Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. An author, speaker, and entertainer all in one, Patsy Claremont is no ordinary preacher. She has a command of God's word, and with her quick wit and fast-paced humor, she will keep you laughing. She has been speaking around North America for over 35 years. To learn more about Patsy, head to patsyclaremont.com. Life is full of battles. We fight back against sin, temptation, and Satan himself, but we can face these battles with confidence. A confidence that doesn't come from our own ability, but rather from the knowledge that God is on our side. Join Patsy as she focuses on the freedom and confidence that comes only from God. Here is Patsy Claremont. It was my birthday. I was eight years old. I could hardly wait to see what I was going to get for my birthday. I waited for those gifts to materialize, but as the hours unfolded, nothing came forth, and I was starting to get cranky. In the afternoon, my dad came home from his milk route, and I just knew he would come in the door singing happy birthday to Patsy, but he didn't. He came in, sat down in his lazy boy, which I thought was a tad redundant, and he sat there and he said, Patsy, I want you to go out on the porch and get my newspaper. Wow, I was so offended in my little eight-year-old spirit. I thought there needs to be child labor laws in this house. I can see that now. But I dragged my pouty little self out to get it because he was bigger than me. And when I got out there on the porch, there to my amazement, was my present. It was a bicycle, green and white and shiny. It was so exciting for me, the very thing that I had wanted. And I rolled that bicycle down the steps, down the sidewalk, into the front walkways, and I was going to get on it, but I needed a little assistance. So my dad came out, and he let down the seat, and let down the seat, and let down the seat, until my tippy toes were touching the top of the pedals. And as they went around, you would see me disappear just under the handlebars, and then my nose and eyes bobbed back up. It was a strange sight going up and down our little neighborhood, but it wasn't long till I got into the rhythm of the road. The wind blowing in my hair, my ponytail bouncing all about. All of the houses had turned into a kaleidoscope of color because of my great speed. It was such a thrill for me. I still remember it. Now fast forward, if you will, 32 years. At that juncture of my life, I'm very married. I have, we have two sons one in the Air Force, and one in junior high. A little slow there. And so my husband came home from work one day, and he said, Patsy, come out here. I have something for you. It's a surprise. And I went out, and it was a bicycle, my second two-wheeler. I hadn't seen one of those since the first one. He said, someone was going to get rid of this, and I thought to myself, my wife would love this. And so I brought it home for you. Well, I thought, how sweet of him. I went into the house, and I was rummaging around in some drawers when my junior high son, Jason, came in, and he said, Mom, 
Want to go for a bicycle ride with me? He said, I'm going into town. Why don't you pedal along? Well, I was so impressed that he wanted to be seen in public with his mother. I couldn't resist this opportunity. Well, of course, son, I'll go with you. So I put on my Reeboks and I bebopped out there to the bicycle, and there stood my husband. And my husband had a look on his face. You know, when people have been married for many seasons, they understand looks on each other's faces. I wasn't crazy about this particular look because it meant he was about to give me instructions. And I couldn't remember raising my hand and asking for any. But anyway, he said, now hold on here just a moment. And I, being a submissive woman, said, what, 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 what? He said, just listen to me now. He said, don't get overconfident. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Patsy, I can tell by looking at you that you are full of yourself. And he said, just don't get overconfident. And he said, and you need to slow down. I said, slow down. I haven't even gone on. How am I going to slow down? He said, I can tell your little brain is pedaling a mile a minute here. And you just need to slow down. And Patsy, whatever you do, don't panic. And I said, panic? He said, when it's time to stop. You see, when I had looked over this bicycle, the thing that was very different from this one and the one from years before was that someone had been tampering with its anatomy. Uh, it, it, probably a man made this adjustment, but because you guys are so clever and mechanical. Did I get out of that all right? Um, but they moved the brakes thank you so much, from the feet up onto the handlebars. Wasn't that clever? And so my husband said, now when you need to stop, you grasp both of them at the same time and gently ease them up to a stop. And I said, yeah, 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 I got it, I got it, come on, let me go. So I leapt onto the bicycle. Well leapt onto it might be a stretch, but I did get up on the thing, and we began to make our way into town. It was quite fun, to tell you the truth, and because I made it all the way one way, my confidence had definitely grown. And on the way back, one might have said, I was rather full of myself because I began to pick up speed. In fact, I was going so fast, I had left my son in my dust. And suddenly, I was into the rhythm of the road, wind blowing in my face. No ponytail bobbing around, though. The houses had turned into a kaleidoscope of color because of my great speed. And it was at that moment that I recognized that the green and white swirl in my kaleidoscope was our house. And that I needed to stop, and I really needed to stop right then. Because just beyond our house was a very well-traveled side street. And it was just in everybody's best interest that I stopped this careening vehicle. Well, <clears throat> I went to take a hold of both sides and of the handlebars to begin this squeeze when I realized that when we came out of the store, I had hung a bag over the left-hand side. And it was annoyingly in my way. I did not have time to make adjustments with it before I was hit by something. So instead, I grabbed the right handlebar and I squeezed as hard as I could. That was really quite effective. 
as the handlebars jerked hard and fast all the way to the right, throwing me up and over the handlebars, and I was cruising. You know, riding a bicycle for a child is the closest they ever come to flying. This actually was flying. I was up, up, and away, and then suddenly I was making a rapid downward descent. It's amazing how closely up and down can be. <laughs> Going up well one moment, crashing down the next. I was headed for the valley of cement at a great speed, and because I'm a multitasker, it isn't in me just to crash. I had to crash and then slide down the sidewalk on my face. That was interesting. I had a, a wonderful cement burn that was created by that. My head stopped inches from the stairway that led up to our front door. So at least I had my address right. Now, when I stopped, I thought to myself, Self, I think I'll just rest a while here. <laughs> and so I was lying there doing a mental inventory, and it wasn't going well. I mean, it felt as though my ribs were in a vice. And you know that little bone that sticks out on your elbow there? They call it a funny bone. It's not funny. I dragged it all the way down that sidewalk, and not once did I laugh out loud over it. <laughs> misnamed, misnamed. And I had this burn up the side of my face as if I needed one more line on my face, thank you. And as I'm lying there going through this mental inventory, my son is now caught up. He's dropped his bike. He's run over. He's standing over his mother waiting to hear what he should do. Now, I want to ask you, if this had been your situation, what might you have said to your son? Get your dad? Well, no. I could just see him standing there going, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know that, I told you so, I told you so. No, don't get your dad, for heaven's sakes. I could have said, call 911. That would have made sense. But no, as I lifted my head off the cement, out of my swollen and cement-encrusted lips came this brilliant and mature thought. Did anybody see? Isn't that pitiful? You really know what you're made of in a moment like that. What is your first comment that comes out of you? Very revealing. Why is it we can't take good advice when it comes our way? Well, I'll tell you from my perspective. It's not that I so minded what was said. It was who was saying it. Why does he always have to be right? That's what I want to know. I can tell you, I have been married for 43 years. Well, thank you. Trust me, that applause goes right to my husband. He deserves every clap of your hand. I've been married for 43 years, and I have learned a lot along the way about relationships, but one of the things that I have to say that annoys me is that more times than not, when God has chosen to speak through someone else to me, other than directly through his word or by his spirit, it has been through the lips of my husband. That's annoying. <laughs> I want to be the one that gets to be right for just a little while. 
every once in a while, and I mean it's rare, I do get my chance, and then I get to do the uh-huh, uh-huh, little boogie. I am resistant at times to good information, excellent counsel. For instance, when Les said, don't get overconfident, slow down, and whatever you do, don't panic. Not only was that good information for me in that bike ride, had I been bright enough to take it, but it is good information to you, to those of you who have been here at Breakforth, who have taken your time out and your energies and your financial investment that you might hear from the Lord. And as he has spoken to your heart, I pray that you have been receptive, not resistant, not finding yourself on a downward trek into the valley of cement, not skidding face first into your humiliation, but choosing to hear what he said and being willing to go and do likewise. I love to go into scripture and find myself. Actually, what I'd like to do is go in and get a verse for my husband. But every time I go in with that attitude, I come back with a verse for me. This is uh, 1 Samuel, and uh, what I found out when I went into the Word is that uh, there are other people who struggle like I do. When I was a young girl, my mother used to tell me, don't get overconfident. But because she was from the South, she didn't say it in those words. In her vernacular, it went like this, Patsy, you're getting a little too big for your britches. And that was a common phrase in the South where my parents were born and raised. And then they moved to the North and had this little Yankee doodle dandy. And then they have spent years saying to me, you're getting too big for your own britches. Well, I went into scripture and I found Mr. Big Britches right in there. And I thought, well, I am not alone. His name is Goliath. He was over nine feet tall. And you know that he was full of himself because of the way that he talks. If we could lean in and listen to what we're saying and the way that we're saying it, it would be to our great value and to our great development. If we would just hear how we sounded to others, we might tone down. We might be quicker to tune in to what God would have us to say instead of just spouting out things. And we hear Mr. Big Britches Goliath spouting out in the scripture. He says, I'm a champion. I'm a big shot. I can take on any of you. Now, there is a war going on between the Israelites and the Philistines. And let me set you up with the geography. Over here is, whoop, let's start over here. I like this side better. Over here is a mountain. And it is full of the Israelites, God's people. Yay! And over here is a mountain, and it's full of the enemy, the Philistines. Boo! Very good. And in between these two mountains is a valley, and that's where the battle takes place. And isn't that true in our own life, that we spend most of our time in the valley? The valley is where we walk out what God longs to work in us, where we learn how truth fits inside of us in the dailiness of living, in the boring times and in those moments when there's great crisis. It is in the valley where God does his deepest work within us. It is my natural instinct to want to go to the mountain. I want to be in a high place, and I want a great view. But this is what I've been learning about mountains and valleys, that when I am on a mountaintop, I can see an eagle soar. But in the valley, 
I can hear a bird sing. I can take in every note of his song. On the mountaintop, I can see trees, but they look like a canopy from up there. But in the valley, I can sit in its shade, and I can eat of its fruit. On the mountaintop, I can see people, and they look like specks. But in the valley, I can trace the face of a child. So while I may prefer to be on the mountain, it's in the valley where life takes place and where I learned the greatest lessons. And this day with Mr. Big Britches, he has come down from his mountaintop full of himself. He steps into the valley and he begins to spout out about his own personal greatness and his ability to take on any of them. Thank you. And the people here, the Israelites, and they are afraid and they cower. They are intimidated, and they run in their vulnerability, and they hide away. They do not group together and find their strength in the Lord, but they separate and they cower. And so every day, Big Britches comes down, and he shouts out again and again and again until one day a young boy leaves his sheep, and he goes to visit his father. And his dad gives him food for his brothers who are up on that mountaintop and asks him to take the food to him, to them. And so he does. And he gets there. And when he's delivering the food, he hears big britches with his big mouth. And those two things go closely together. Big britches, big mouth, check a mirror. And so when he comes down, I did. I was in real trouble. And so when he's out there shouting out again all of these threats, David hears. Young David. Young David who has been out with the sheep and has faced danger of lions and bears who have come in to eat the lambs. And he has battled with them. And he knows that God has strengthened him to fight off the enemies. And now he sees an enemy in big britches, over nine feet tall. And here's young David. And David says to the other Israelites, what's the matter here, man? Well, it may not say it just like that. You might want to read this story for accuracy later on your own. But it was something like that. Don't let him get on your last nerve. I'll take him on. And so they run and they tell King Saul. David said he'd fight him. They bring him in here. He's only one so far. Let me see him. So he brought David to him and he said, hey, you know, I don't know what you're thinking. This guy has been a warrior since his youth and you are but a youth. And he says, the God that protected me. Now get this. This is how he draws on his history. The faithfulness of God that he has seen throughout his life is what he draws on so that he is able to take the next step to face this enemy. Use your history. What has God done for you? Has he been there in your illness? Has he been there when you've lost a job? Has he made provision for your family? Has he brought you the right person into your life at the moment you needed them? Have you heard the right song or read the right book or been in the right place and you knew that that was ordained by a living God who had you in mind? Draw on that history. And David looked at the faithfulness of God in his life, and he said, the God who protected me there will protect me now, and I will go forth, and I will fight him. And so Saul dresses him up in his armor. Now, Saul's armor didn't fit young David. It was big and clunky and awkward, and David was unaccustomed to it. He could hardly get around. Have you ever had someone in your life try to remake you to be like them? Here, you need to be this way or you need to be that. And you tried to put on what they said and it just didn't fit. 
Well, I've been there and done that as well. Not only have I tried to wear some armor that was never designed for me that belonged to someone else, but I've tried to put a few pieces on a couple members of my family. And uh, they definitely wanted to clunk me with it. So the, the clunky armor didn't work, and David took it off. And he did what he knew to do that was right for him. He did what he knew to do that was right for him. What is right for you? What have you heard this weekend that you know God is speaking into your spirit for you to do? What changes are necessary? What apologies need to be made? What relationships need to be mended? What ministries need to begin? I don't know where you're at, but I know a God who has history. And that God has specific divine plan for you. He longs to use you. And he longs for you to be willing to receive what only he can do. David didn't have the ability to fight this warrior other than the fact that he went in the name that is above every name. The difference between arrogance and confidence. We see arrogance in old big britches who says, I am a great warrior. Then we see confidence in David who says, my God, my God shall protect me and he will bring you down. And it says that David didn't just step out into that valley. He raced. He ran with all his might as fast as he could to get the job done. And with one swing of his sling, one pebble placed right where it need to be brought the enemy down. When we feel intimidated and insecure and unable to handle all of the things that are coming at us, may we remember young David and his courage as he drew on the history of a God who continues throughout all of time to be faithful, and to make provision for us. My husband said to me, Patsy, don't get overconfident. I wish I'd listened. I have since then, most of the time. He also said, slow down. Now, what is there about slow down that makes me want to accelerate? I don't know, but I find it very difficult to slow down, and yet I find it needful. I remember when my husband took a job for the Boy Scouts of America, and he was going to be a ranger, and we were going to live on a reservation. I didn't know what that meant. But when we got there, it was over 600 acres of lakes and um, swampy areas and paths and forests, and it was great fun for raising boys in a place like that. And when we got there, I didn't have any neighbors, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll have to compensate for that. Heaven forbid I just slow down. So I took up cross-country skiing. Now, that's a wonderful sport and one that's very popular up here, but one that I was totally unacquainted with. I had never done any type of skiing, and the reason I chose it is I thought the clothes were cute that you could get to ski in. See, you're learning a lot about the depth of my character. And so I went and I bought these cute little powder blue bib overalls. So darling. And I found a little jacket to match, and I had a turtleneck. I love turtlenecks. You can slip extra chins down inside there. You know, the problem I have now is I'm having to clip it to my earrings to get them all tucked in. Who needs surgery when you've got these, for heaven's sakes? It's so much cheaper. And um, so... Let's see now, how did I get there? Oh, yes, and then I had a little knit cap with a little frou-frou on top. I thought that was awfully cute, and a little matching mittens, and I had a pair of goggles. Boy, that made me feel so official. 
And then I, I had, oh yeah, the skis. So um, I had those as well. And my husband said to me, as I was getting ready to glide out onto the 600 acres, he said, this is not wisdom. I said, what now? He said, no, no, listen to me, Patsy. You, you don't know how to do this. Up, oh, nothing to it, I said to him. He said, listen, there's 600 acres. If you get lost out there, I won't know where you are. I'm not going to get lost. If you get hurt out there, who will help you? I'm not going to get hurt. And I got lots of arrogance. And so uh, as I started to glide away, he called one loving phrase out to me. He said, if you get lost out there, I'm not looking for you till spring. Love you too, honey. See you later. And I, I glided off. Well, it wasn't exactly a glide initially, but I, then I fell into that rhythm that comes, and I thought, woo, I got it now. And after a little while, I thought, I'm going to do something else now. I've done this. What can I do now? And it was right then that I, I, I was passing a hill. And I thought, I can do this. It's just a hill. I can do this. I've seen it done on TV. I didn't realize they had a different kind of ski to do it with or, or that they'd practiced. I just thought, I can do this. I can do this. And so I kind of got my skis around in place, and then I thought, let's see now. What do they do on TV? Oh, yeah, they bend their knees, and then they bounce like this. I don't know why, but I'm doing it, and I'm feeling pretty good. And I, then I bring my poles up under my arms, and then I lean forward, and suddenly I am shooting down the side of that hill, going faster than I'd ever gone in my life. It was in those microseconds that it struck me, this may not have been my most brilliant move. <laughs> One of the things that kind of convinced me of that was that the lake wasn't fully frozen at the bottom of the hill, and I don't swim. I thought, no, this, this may not have been in my long-term best interest. And so I began looking for the brakes, and I was squeezing the ends of those poles. I don't care how easy or hard I squeezed them, I didn't slow down at all. And, and then I realized, Patsy, you're not going to drown in that lake because you're going to hit that stand of trees before you ever get there. It was evergreens. And uh, I thought, do something. So I jumped sideways and, and I went into the tree. I think I bounced off every tree trunk in that little wad of trees which protected me from the lake. And I hit, bang, hit, bang. I felt like a pinball in a machine. Bing, 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 bing. And then I stopped, and I thought, I think I'll slow down now. <laughs> and so I lay there, and things didn't feel like they were all in the same place. I, I had lost a ski. I'm not sure where it was. And my, my goggles were just a little lopsided, and I... I hurt almost everywhere. First, I hurt nowhere, and then I hurt everywhere. It was interesting how close those two are. And then um, finally, I thought, I got to make it back home. And I dragged myself up the hillside. I could see someone would be in the trees filming me for the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. I just knew it. And I got to the top, and I dragged my way back to the house. I buried my ski next to the house after I wedged it off and my pole, so you know who didn't see it right off the bat. Then I tiptoed across the porch and into the house and into the bedroom, and I sat down on the edge of the bed. About that time, my husband walked in. I didn't say anything, and he began, I could see, his body was doing this. He seemed to be trying to contain it. 
but his whole body was shaking like this. It really aggravated me. And then he turned and he went out rapidly, I think, to go chortle safely in another space. And I thought, well, how did he know? And then I decided it might have been the pine cone and top of my hat, sir. It could have been these pine needles I was still pulling out of my teeth. But I, I think it was the goggles because I looked in the mirror and they were sitting like this across my face. And so I slipped them off. And when I did, I saw the container they had come on, come in. And it, on the top of the card, it said, high altitude glasses. And I thought, that's what I need. I need a higher perspective than mine because I sure can make some crummy choices left on my own that put me on a downward trek in a hurry, honey. I need counsel that is holy. I need to hear from God. I need to know what he says to me about the choices I make that I might be wiser in what I do. And I need to listen to the people that he puts in my path, no matter how much they aggravate me at moments, that I need to lean in and listen. He uses the most unlikely of us to say some of the most profound things that when we have space inside of us and we're able to embrace it, it can change us forever. But we are reluctant to have anybody else telling us what to do. Last of all, my husband said to me, not only slow down, but don't panic. I am the queen of panic. I panic quickly and easily, and I grew up to be a panicker. I was agoraphobic. I had one panic after another. They became a way of life until gradually, as I began to take in the word, liberty began to come into my life that I had not known, courage that I had never experienced before, wisdom beyond my little bitty thoughts. And he began to set me free. I know about panic. I am a shopper. I'm not recommending it. I'm just confessing it. I am a shopper. I'm very good at it. I'm fast and efficient, and, uh, and I would love to teach you lessons on it. But anyway, I, uh, there was nothing in here on that, so I gave it up. And um, I was shopping one day, and I saw a duvet cover. Duvet, I thought. How French. And so I bought one and I took it home. Now, a duvet cover for the bed um, requires you to put a comforter inside the duvet cover. And I had not considered that was one of the steps to making this efficient. So when I got home and it was a king size duvet cover, I opened up the king size duvet cover on the floor. My husband had run out doing errands. I was there by myself and it covered the entire bedroom floor. And I'm up against the draperies now thinking to myself, how do I get that comforter into this duvet cover? It just seemed like a bigger job than I knew how to handle. And then I thought, well, let's make it over to the comforter. So I thought, well, I'll roll it up. Well, when you roll up a comforter, a king-size comforter, it is humongous. It's about the same height as Goliath. And I thought, now how do I get this over there? So I dragged it, and I pulled it, and, I, and it would just unfurl as I was going. And I thought, this is not going well. And I finally got it over there. But now how do I get it inside? And I tried cramming, and it just formed an enormous cram right in the opening. And, and I, I, I tried kicking. I, I just didn't know how one does that. So then I stood, and I looked at that, and I thought, I don't have a choice. I'm going to have to go in. So I got down. And I took a hold of the end of it. And, woo! And I began to work it. Hey, that was pretty good. And I began to work it all the way down to the corner. Now, may I say this? It's dark in there. It's kind of a tight space. And once you and the comforter get in there, there's no way to get out. Not conveniently. 
you know, so I'm trying to pat the comforter down to make enough space for me to make it out. But every time I pat it down, it grows bigger right ahead of me. So it's like a long process. And when I'm stuck way back here in the corner, my husband came home. He stood over the top of this huge lump. And he said, what are you doing in there? He said, you look like a squirrel packing away nuts for the winter. So I began padding my way out of there. I got right to where you step out. And he was holding it close. Isn't that precious? He thought that was so cute. And so I said words to him. I don't think they're in the New Testament. They might be in the old, though. And <clears throat> he ran rapidly, as quickly as he could, to another room, and I got out. For just a moment, when I couldn't get out, I felt like I did when I was an agoraphobic and I couldn't get out of my house. Don't, don't trap me in. And you know what Jesus said? I've come to set you free. I got the key. I know the way out. I want you to have life and to have it more abundant. I don't want you afraid. I don't want you terrorized. I don't want you hemmed in. I want you to know the liberty that I can give you. My husband was so right when he said to me, Patsy, don't get overconfident. Slow down. And for heaven's sakes, don't panic. There was a woman who wrote these words that are now carved on the side of a castle in England. It says, I stood at the door of the new year and I said, give me a light that I might see my way safely into the unknown. And a voice came to me and said, instead, step into the darkness and take the hand of God for it will be to you better than a light and safer than a known way. We have no need to panic. And yes, we can be confident, but it borders on arrogant. Make sure you're not big britches, but that you are David as you go into the battle of your day and your business and your family and whatever you feel that you are fighting for and against that you might go in the name of the Lord and slow down. If you're anything like me, you're going way too fast. You need to be still and know that he is Lord and longs to do great things through you. And so to you this day, I encourage you that you take all that you have been learning all that you have been listening to, all that you have been receiving, and break forth. Break forth with joy and with new liberty and in obedience that you might celebrate Jesus and he might be high and lifted up in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, May you become fully alive in the love of God.